of I Am Interchange. This is the Hatch Podcast Series. In America's oldest capital city and home to over 21 million residents, Mexico City is the largest Spanish-speaking city and among the most productive urban centers in the world. It is equally rich in diversity and culture, providing home to a wide range of indigenous peoples, expatriates, and immigrants. Though infamous for a bloody history marked by conquest, wars, and violent rebellion, modern Mexico City offers a glimpse of community at its finest, in an iteration seldom experienced with such impassioned conviction elsewhere. I'm Tate Chamberlain, and in this podcast, I host Enrique Lomnitz and Gabriela Vargas Romero as we reflect on the city's resilient population, innovative regenerative solutions, and hope in all its vibrant colors. I'm Tate Chamberlain. This is the Hatch Podcast Series, and we're in Mexico City. We've got Enrique Lomnitz and Gabriela Vargas Romero with me today. Pleasure to see you both. Thanks for being here. Pleasure to be here. Yeah, pleasure to be here. Thanks. (laughs) We're going to do this in English just because most of our listeners are English. And we're outside, so join us in our adventure journalism with airplanes and cars honking and lots of background noise. (laughs) It makes for the experience of where we're at. Can you tell me a little bit about where we are right now? Geographically? Yeah. We're in southern Mexico City in a district called Coyoacán. Coyoacán was until probably like the 1960s or 70s its own town kind of a little bit separate from mexico city people used to come kind of you know for like for the a weekend day trip. <laughs> for a day trip here now it's you know fully engulfed by the city but it still has its kind of colonial plaza in the center a lot of the original conquistadores the original like first liege of spanish that arrived here had their houses around here so there's still like a house that belonged to hernan cortes to alvarado there's a house here that was supposed to belong to the Malinche. In mm-hmm. La Plaza La Conchita, mm-hmm. there's like a house mm-hmm. that was the indigenous woman who was translator to and then later like a sort of informal wife of, of Hernán Hernan Cortés. Cortés. Mm-hmm. And she's an interesting character because she's considered the first kind of person that gave birth to a mestizo in Mexico. Now she's like the mother of us all in a way and that she's like an indigenous woman who partnered with a Spaniard and gave birth to the first mestizo. So her house is in here in Coyacán. So part of the city with a lot of history, no? There's a lot of history here. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And a very famous blue house. Yeah, Frida <laughs> Kahlo Frida used to live here. House. <laughs> People pilgrimage to that house. And and and, and Leon Trotsky's house. Mm-hmm. Well, Leon right Trotsky was killed yeah. with an ice pick. Yeah, like. he was. No, and, and you can see the bullets. So, think, <laughs> and it's been a museum for a long time, and it was an open. Nobody like. Yeah, I don't think anyone really ever gave much of a shit about no. that museum. But yeah. it's interesting, and it's yeah. there. No, and mm-hmm. it's where he was killed mm-hmm. by, you know, Stalinist goons. <laughs> so there's yeah, there's uh, history everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Both of you have a special relationship to Mexico City. What does Mexico City mean to you? Oof. Mexico City, I think it's where the heart of Mexico lies a lot. There's a lot of like the history when the Aztecs got to Mexico City, the signs they saw, they have a lot of deep, profound significance for our, for our culture. I love Mexico City. It's a crazy city. It's got you know, like all these bad, crazy Things happening, the air is terrible to breathe, the water probably is scarcing, it's contaminated, it's, not, it's like, but it's a magic city. Anything can happen here. So. Yeah, no, I always had the, the sense in Mexico City that you like step out of your house in the morning and you're like, you kind of knock on wood and like <laughs> see like what the day brings. No, it's, it's an eternally unfolding adventure, the city. In fact. Mm. Mm. Mm-hmm. There's That's a, a lot of cities in this city. No, there's no so many different realities <laughs> happen yeah. at the same time in the city. I think you could easily cut Mexico City into four cities, and they would each be like a significant major city in their own right. You're both here because you're really passionate about your projects, and maybe would you call yourself activists in a way? Yeah, I think so. It's not sure. the first thing that I think of myself as, but yeah. increasingly I think that, yeah, that is actually what, what I am and what we are. See, I, uh, I've been you know, like an active activist at some moments in my life, but yeah, I, I, it's also like Enrique, it's not like the first thing, but I do consider, I, I do activism. Will you tell me about your favorite project that you're working on right now? 
Ok. Paso, boy. Este, <laughs> I have, I have like two projects because what I do is urban gardens and Huerto Tlatelolco is one of my like favorite projects. I've been doing that for 10 years and it's getting to a point when, where the project is like starting to fly on its own a little more. So it's a project I'm very passionate about. And right now I'm starting a project that brings back my old life as a photographer and working in the film industry a little and my heart path, which is being an urban gardener. And I want to produce a series, a, like a TV series around urban agriculture, bridge narrative agriculture projects and bring them out to the light. So I'm working on that. Almost all of my projects mm -hmm. are directly related to implementing rainwater harvesting systems in places that have like a lot of water precariousness. And most of our work has actually been kind of peri-urban in and around Mexico City, Guadalajara, other cities like that where there's like these complex water crises. And we install rainwater harvesting systems in homes and schools and stuff. Right now, a project that I – and I mean, honestly, I love a lot of the projects mm -hmm. we do. But if I had to pick a favorite for now and recognizing that that's kind of a bit of a moving target, but – We're doing this work that we've been doing for many years with an indigenous community in northwestern Mexico, the Huirarica, more commonly known as the Huichol. And we install rainwater harvesting systems in those communities. And that's like a very, very remote, isolated, very interesting, very like its own kind of nation within Mexico kind of little pocket. And we're working towards achieving universal water coverage with that whole nation. It's like an indigenous nation within the country. Mm -hmm. And... That's always been a project that I've, you know, that I love. I love the adventure of it. I love the the remoteness and the the complexity and the difficulty in working in like such a kind of foreign, remote, isolated place. But the project has been especially interesting recently because we've we've been working on kind of a lot of capacities building within the community so that the communities can do things that we used to do as an organization that they can do more autonomously, especially in response to this like big narco war that's mm -hmm. happening in the area that made it a lot more complicated for us to go to the Sierra. And so we've been working a lot on kind of co-creating with local with a local team like capacities for them to be able to do not only installing rainwater harvesting systems but doing all kinds of kind of community work and education work and that that work of you know working together with people from these communities to try to like shore up and develop the capacity for them to kind of solve their own water crisis problems autonomously has been super interesting super challenging super fun and like really motivating i think right now that's on the top of my projects i like wake up excited to work on i had the opportunity to spend some days you no know, a couple of years ago with you no know, at that project you no know, and it was amazing uh, for me it's like i want to go back sometime. we have to go back yes. see we haven't been doing <laughs> agriculture there but we have to start because they ask for it all the time see ah no well mm -hmm. I, no i thought they they had started a project liliana's yeah. been doing agriculture yeah. okay mm -hmm. i thought but they're still doing it no she was as far as i know no see That's that's what no. It's like the natural step, no. Like bring them, bring them back that ancient knowledge that they have. It's really yeah. interesting, no, because they have. I mean, this is a community that has been subsistence farming for you know Centuries. hundreds of years, <laughs> if not that whatever thousands of years. But there's these interesting crossroads now where like the traditional forms of agriculture that they practiced for a long time are not as viable now as they were before when it was like a smaller population and they weren't kind of so encroached no so now like there's kind of a need for i feel like a renovation and there's this interesting work to be done there marrying like this very traditional deep knowledge that they have of like the agriculture that they've practiced where they're it's very sacred and they grow corn in five different colors and it's all really like deeply tied into the whole like kind of or the origin mythologies and it's like a very very spiritual kind of practice the agriculture they do no, see, see see it's like it's profound cosmo vision farming see. but that's in also need of you know acquiring kind of like some renovating practices and stuff so that they can take better care of the soil and 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 stuff like that so it's a great time to work with these communities see. when you bring up the difference in scale of the communities you mentioned that it took a different type of agriculture to be applied like little tweaks to it in order to feed a higher population 
Do you think that cities have the capabilities to sustain their own food systems? Or will they always rely on rural, on a hinterland? I think there could be a potential for for doing at least half of our needs to food production here. But it would need a very strong support from government from no the, the, the space is the thing no where are you going to plant all that food mm-hmm. no? and there are spaces but a space in the city is very valuable because it can be turned into mm-hmm. business or housing or so there could be a potential there's a lot of underused areas in the city that could be turned into food production areas that water is a challenge in the city so that would be something that would have to be worked together and having because we get a lot of rain in the city too so there could be a good opportunity if we could like save catch the water save the water use the water for dry season and we could produce a lot but more than Seeing the cities as self-sustaining their food production, I see that growing food and bringing agriculture back into the cities, I talk a lot about agrarian urbanism as an opportunity for people that live in the cities to get back in contact with the production of the food, for starters, to know how they grow, what part of the plant you're eating, how does the carrot grow or the beet or lettuce. It's like coming back to that ancient knowledge. And being aware of that makes you like a more conscious consumer and then you start taking actions from different places. Eating is basic for all. Also, no, we should hopefully eat in three times a day. Um, Sounds nice. Yeah. The thing is having access to good food because what we're eating right now is not really food in a way. I agree. I mean, I think that I'm not sure that, you know, 100% self food sufficiency for the city is is, is possible. I'm not 100% sure how important that would be in itself. I think that there's a lot of room for for increased self food production within the city and there's like some like you know very stark opportunities that we're totally not taking advantage of like mm-hmm. Xochimilco and mm-hmm. the canal district there's like one little part of southeastern Mexico City where the kind of the ancient lake marsh canal systems persist and there's like a form of agriculture that's uh, autochthonous native to yeah. central Mexico the chinampa farming which is a really interesting and beautiful and highly productive kind of organic agriculture and and, you know, there's still, you know, a significant number of square kilometers of this yeah, kind of is, agriculture. A lot. And like 90% of it is fallow. It's not being used. So there's a huge potential there for increasing food production in not, not only within the city, but within this kind of incredibly interesting ancient system of food production that's super ecological and is like, you know, it's frankly just very, very beautiful. And that is, you know, being under underused almost entirely. So I think that there's a couple of really interesting opportunities. And within the valley of Mexico, beyond Mexico City, you know, the, the kind of immediate hinterland around the city, I think that there's there's space for for much greater and better food production. But Mexico City gets its food in kind of interesting ways. It's a lot less centralized and coordinated than I think other like large cities. And the big market, the big food market, the Central de Abastos in Mexico City, which is like one of the biggest markets, yeah, if not the, the biggest, world. and it's kind sí, in the world. No, it's, it's like sí. hectares and hectares sí. of, of like food markets. And most of the food that, that comes there is brought on the back of thousands of pickup trucks that are coming from very small hold mm-hmm. family farms who load up their pickup trucks with food and come and negotiate prices there. And most of the city is being fed with these By like fleets producers. of autonomous, uh-huh, like little pickup trucks bringing food from small producers. And that is a really beautiful thing and i think it's a great thing that in mexico industrial agriculture i mean as much as it's it's there it's big in many cases i'm sure it's growing it's still actually most of our food is produced by small hold family farms and that i hope we could kind of keep grow and and improve the conditions because a lot of these people are actually very poor and yeah Yeah, that's the thing that it's not a a just system no at all so that would be a thing 
to be able to produce a part of the food here in the city? Because I think there is a, 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 a huge need. There's a lot of value and there's a need to get access to really nutritious and healthy food for our population. Um, and that's not happening in most of the city. I mean, having access to organic produce, to local produce, it's right now only available if you have certain economic power to buy those things or get closer. And I think healthy, clean, local food has to be accessible for everyone. So that's, I think, the, the, a lot of the power. And also in re-educating ourselves in nutrition, yeah, education, alimentary education, because we've lost that. So eating is just eating whatever you have on the table, tastes good, so you'll have it and it makes you feel full. So that's perfect, but that's not. Right now, we are, it's been very tangible to see how vulnerable, vulnerable, I could not say that one, uh, our health is not that the population in Mexico as a country is very affected and that's basically for what we're eating. We've lost a lot of our extraordinary gastronomic culture and it's been substituted by sugar, you know, and a lot of high, highly produced food, which is very satisfying with the flavors and the feeling of being full, but it's, it's not healthy. And that's got a lot of consequences, not only physically, but I think in, in a lot of levels. Enrique, in the U.S., it depends on the state, but there can sometimes be a lot of laws around collecting stormwater. Mm. Are there any hurdles and obstacles to collecting stormwater in Mexico or the city? And how, in what ways, to people who aren't as familiar with water capturing, how would you apply a water capturing method to uh, a building or a property? We've never really had any obstacles related to like, you know, code or, or legal acts or something. Mexico is actually very permissive with things. Rainwater harvesting is actually, you know, a couple years ago, maybe 10 or eight years ago or so, Mexico City ratified a new constitution. And in the constitution, even it says that collecting rainwater is a right, you know? So Mexico is actually very kind of allows that kind of stuff. And I think that the, the, in general, the culture in Mexico is very much towards kind of letting people do what they want to do, at least within the, within their property. You can kind of do whatever you want. I mean, and, and I think one of the things that people kind of like and love about Mexico, myself included, is the like vast freedom that, that you feel here. So you're definitely allowed to harvest rainwater and kind of do what you want. There's obviously a host of other challenges that we face that range from just, you know, the economic kind of challenges that are present, especially when you work as we do in very low income parts of the city, corruption, all kinds of, you know, structural obstacles that there are. But really, we've never so far, and knock on wood, had any obstacles that don't get kind of overcome through, you know, some combination of persistence and kind of, you know, finding a way around things and being creative. Just for kind of understanding what we're talking about when we're talking about rainwater harvesting in this context, we uh, install rainwater harvesting systems where the water that falls on the roof of a house or a building of some kind, we can channel through gutters and downspouts, pipes, through some form of treatment, filtration or something, store it in a tank, maybe chlorinate it a little bit. If necessary, pass it through some, you know, final stage filtration, make it available for use within the building or house. It can be very simple systems, actually. And Mexico City has like a monsoon rain pattern. So about half the year during the summer, we have, you know, very intense rain events and very frequent rain. And then we have the other half of the year, mostly, you know, winter and spring, very dry. So rainwater harvesting is usually a, you know, kind of a half year solution. But during that half year, you can often get you know, most or all of a family's water needs met through rainwater harvesting, which, you know, when you consider how many neighborhoods in Mexico City suffer chronic water access problems is pretty significant. No, you can have, you know, five, six months of the year at least of, you know, close to total water autonomy, if not water, total water autonomy. 
and then you know the other half of the year in general you know you you return to using water from from the grid or something but with an overall reduction of maybe 50% of the house's water demand on the city so there are these very simple systems that you can attach to houses or schools or any other kind of building and and basically just make the rain that falls on that house available for use do you see any examples of people fusing the water capture so when you say that the households are making enough water. That's just for showers and cooking and drinking water. Or could they apply it to an urban garden somewhere around the building? They can. Sometimes. And sometimes they do. In fact, in Gavi's Huerto, we've installed a rainwater harvesting system. We've done several kind of things together where we've done kind of combined rainwater harvesting and agriculture stuff. Usually when you're doing agriculture, your kind of demand for water is high enough that rainwater harvesting is often not kind of enough, Not enough for that no so it's usually we usually focus rainwater harvesting more on meeting kind of the human needs within the household and then in many cases ideally you could be using kind of second use water for for agriculture no like and you'll see this done kind of you know artisanally in people's houses all over the city you know people like do their laundry wash their clothes but then they have like a barrel or something in the water that comes out of the washing machine they'll store in there and they'll use that to water their plants plants. and to flush their toilets and stuff like that no the more you go into areas of the city where there's higher levels of water precariousness you start seeing these actually pretty sophisticated interesting spontaneously developed like cultures of water conservation (laughs) yeah super technologies and and a lot of these technologies i mean they, they basically like boil down to just really really carefully honed habits on how you can get you know two or even three uses out of like a any bucket. given volume of water wow. yeah no? <laughs> and and it's admirable i mean sometimes people think that we're going to teach people in communities how to be efficient with water but like it's <laughs> it's much more the other way around honestly yeah. <laughs> is that like we've encountered like some really really phenomenal creativity with which people are able to make you know they say, like, make a dollar out of 15 cents, like, make a gallon out of 15 milliliters of water, because that's what people are doing. Mm-hmm. As populations grow, should humanity move into cities that are more dense or redevelop mm. virgin land into new cities? That is a super fun conversation. <laughs> say, say that? Okay. <laughs> I mean, I love to fantasize about, like, designing a new city from the ground up on virgin land, but I think that that's rarely the right thing to do. No, it's that I tend to think that densifying existing cities and making more space for... Uh, you know, I tend to think more that if we have low-density developments, we would just cover the entire surface of the world and it makes sense to have denser cities that allow for a little bit more land to be set aside you know to be things like forests or farmland etc so that's what i tend to think but i but I, I, I like to think and i talk a lot about how urban agriculture and all of these uh, this kind act of actions that bring together eco technologies like rain harvesting like using biodigesters turning the waste into something valuable for our crops it's like building towards healthier cities it's like we have the cities that's a reality we're living in high densely populated areas that's a reality that's not going to change i don't think i agree with enrique it's not like going and opening new areas and to build more cities just more (laughs) spacey cities it's not i think it's the cities that we have now it's how we can make living in the city in a healthier way for not only for humans but other beings that share the city with us that's creating green quality areas making the most of the resources that we have here in the city yeah i agree i mean my dream would more be you know how do you take a city and try to see how many square kilometers of street can you turn into so, forest and park so, rather than you know how know. many buildings <laughs> how many families you take <laughs> outside yeah, you the move city out to- north. but it, there's always something oh. interesting you know and and, pro- and you know project like new full new city projects which i think of all there's always been this kind of utopian new city kind of thing that exists in some places like the line in Saudi Arabia now or something. I mean, there's something like super fascinating and super kind of appealing about the idea that this time we're going to do it right from the ground up. But there often seems to be something a little dystopic to me oftentimes about that because there's often something where like I like the quality of cities where there's like an organic kind of chaos to them as well. Like take Mexico City. Mexico City is an interesting case in that 
I think something like somewhere between 60 and 70 percent of all of the houses and buildings in the city are self-built in that there's not they're like designed and built by the family that lives Mm -hmm. in it probably with some construction workers and stuff but without you know engineers or architects and so the houses are all kind of quirky and people are like adding rooms and they start with like a thing and then they like stick another room on it. And then when the kids are older, yeah, they like that, build that's another like floor the, on top. The, the, varilla, the la varilla de la the esperanza. It's like no? the, <laughs> the rebar of hope. <laughs> no, hope for a better tomorrow exactly. with like a second we'll, floor on exactly. your house. It's like next level and next level. <laughs> and there's something like about that, that like when I started Isla Urbana, we started in a neighborhood in the Ajusco, in the mountain that you can see over there on the very edge, mm-hmm. very peri-urban area. And that was all, you know, self-built, unplanned, like land invasions where like there was no urbanism, there was no urban planning. It was just like people staking out land and like building the neighborhoods and the houses. And the street that I used to live on had all these trees growing out of the middle of the street. Like the middle of the pavement, there's just the pavement and like trees growing out of the street. And I asked one of the neighbors there, you know, like, how did that come about? And they were like, well, when they were paving the streets, you know, there were, you know, hundreds of thousands of miles of unpaved streets because the city was growing so quickly in the 70s and 80s. So the government had a program where they would arrive at a neighborhood, they would come with these big like dump trucks and they drop asphalt and they drop gravel and then they'd give like a tractor and a steamroller and they'd be like, you guys have a week and then we're coming and taking the tractor to the next neighborhood. (laughs) And so the whole community would come out and be like, oh, my cousin knows how to drive a tractor. And they'd all like pitch in to buy the diesel (laughs) and everybody would be out on the street, you know, like, like leveling the ground and laying out the gravel and stuff and like self paving their, their streets. And they were cutting down trees. And there was this one young woman in the block and she was like, no fucking way you're cutting down these trees like you're gonna kill me before you cut down the trees and so so there was like a whole like neighborhood like thing but we need to pay like we don't have time for this like the tractors we only have we on wednesday they're coming for the tractors and so they were like well pave and so then they decided to just pave around the trees and the result was this street full of trees sticking out of the street and it was great because cars couldn't go fast because they had to zigzag around so kids could play in the street nobody could speed the street was kind of a forest and that's something that would never have happened with like you know top down States. planning it's just something that like happens when people are building their own city and there's like something about the idiosyncrasy and the kind of like cool weird like serendipitous things that happen that way that when you have like a top down plan like i am the sheik and i'm gonna plan a city you really don't, don't get don't have that opportunity <laughs> see exactly not to participate <laughs> more organically in the building of your city so i like that stuff I, I i like that about mexico city i like that about cities in general that are you know hodgepodged and layered and there's the contributions of all kinds of people going into building them so in that sense also i'm more for like let's make them denser let's make them greener let's reduce the need for private transportation etc but let's not spread out and and occupy the whole territory no? i agree with you say 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 totally when i hear the term desertification i usually think of a desert but you could also describe a city as desertification just soil covered in concrete that can't be used right yeah right so enters the term rewilding that's kind of a, a term that's being thrown around the world right now. How would you rewild a city? What does it look like to make cities more green for not only carbon sequestration, but also bringing back ecosystems that have been lost due to the desertification? For me, it's let's make urban gardens and really dive with a lot of plants, pollinator plants, track trees, fruit trees, some Huerta de Lorco is a good example of what you can do in a small space. I mean, we're in a 1,600 square meter area, and but there there can be a 9.5 grade centigrade grade difference between the entrance and the center of the garden. So that makes it very obvious what kind of effect the garden is having in the immediate area as far as the temperature climate change yeah. temperature yeah you humidity, mentioned but also no, we've been trying to register and record all the species of insects that we have and the birds that have that get to the garden and 
as far as we have now, and we've only been doing this for the last two years, on and off, depends if we have a biologist not doing their social service or something that can really focus on that, but we have almost 20 species of birds, different species of birds that visit the garden or have lived there, and around 62 different species of insects as far as we're now. So uh, that's what I was saying by... No urban gardens and not making cities greener is not only for the people that we live in, but only the other beings that share the city with us. And right now, I just moved into a new apartment that already has a garden, a productive garden on the rooftop. And last night, I was spending a little while there looking at the few stars that you can see with all the lights in the city, but you can still see some. And there's bats. Wow. Mm -hmm. And it was amazing, no? Because I'm really in a very downtown area, very urban. There's not my, many parks around. And it was amazing to see bats flying around. So I think there is a lot of potential of bringing, not that rewilding cities. I think it has a lot of potential and we, it should be something that we could be doing and taking much more seriously. We have, a, like Chapultepec, no? we have a, a huge, I don't know, do you know how extensive like the, the, the area the park is, like the three sections? I think it's almost twice Central Park. Okay, like it's the three sections. Park. It's yeah, a very, you, the whole thing. The no, whole it's, thing. It's a, huge, it's a huge area, and there's parts that are really not visited by public. There's other parts that are not full of museums and the zoo, and there's always a lot of human traffic there. But there's the second, and the, the third section is basically pretty wild, but hasn't been taken care of as trying to bring back the original ecosystem that was there because right now it's full of eucalyptus trees which is not a native species it adapted very good here so and there's a lot of abandoned dogs there so <laughs> it, it's even it, it, it's even dangerous to go to the third section you, you can, can get be, eaten by feral yeah, dogs exactly <laughs> see there's the, people have, have been attacked yeah say. no it's <laughs> <laughs> that kind of crazy thing no? and they're all like pedigree you know? but they were just <laughs> dropped there but there you can see labradors you wild can see poodles golden. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> like, well, <laughs> So another thing the, you could see in Mexico City, right. yeah, <laughs> a pack of wild poodles. <laughs> <laughs> so there is a lot of uh, area we could be working on, but as everything, it requires a lot of uh, will from different sectors to get together and really want to do things. Like what's work. really what's really cool to me about this stuff is just how capable, like how much you can see that if you even just take relatively modest measures to set aside some space for rewilding, how kind of fast that can be. There's this kind of constructed wetland that's attached to a wastewater treatment plant that was built in a new park in eastern Mexico City, Parque Cuitlawa, uh, where some people mm -hmm. that we, we both know have mm -hmm. been involved in doing mm -hmm. several things in that, in that park. It's a park that's built over a landfill, you know, like yeah. a sealed off landfill. And they built this wastewater treatment plant and they put this, I don't know, when I went there, they, they were still working on it. There was maybe like a hectare of constructed wetland, which is what, two acres or something like that. And it had been run, what it had been, you know, with water and constructed for maybe like two months or something. And there was, when I went there, there was like this family of like little ducks that flew, that migrate through here from Alaska. And they, yeah. like, as soon as they, they set up this, this constructed wetland, it was just like full of birds from all over the place. And Mexico City used to be, the valley of Mexico used to be dominated by these lakes and wetlands. There was like 1,400 square kilometers of lake surface or something like mm -hmm. that in the wow. valley. Mm -hmm. And it was one of the most densely populated by birds areas in the country. And it was like a major focus of bird diversity, both, you know, number of species and number of individuals, just like a densely bird-filled habitat here. And that's been largely lost. But 
wherever someone sets aside a little bit of water and wetlands, like the birds are back in like a week. And that's, you know, encouraging to see just how quickly things return. So I have a lot of kind of belief and faith in the possibility of regeneration and rewilding. All we need to do is kind of set set space aside. And in, in my vision for Mexico City, I would emphasize along with urban gardens and kind of urban foresting in the streets and stuff, uh, recreating water wetlands. habitats, yeah. wetlands, because that's yeah. really what this place yeah. was was like most originally, densely that's like rich. The original yeah. vocation of the city. The original yeah. vocation and like our mm-hmm. richest reserves of biodiversity and, and ecosystem kind of diversity, etc., was in like wetlands, you know? So I would love to see Mexico City fill with constructed wetlands. We could, you know, we could treat a lot of our wastewater, which right now just goes into the rivers yeah. without anything mm-hmm. for the most part. And I'm sure we'd be just like, you know, full of birds. And then people would complain about all the birds. Like, yeah, and all the their birds shit getting in their cars. <laughs> Your car. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll, I'll, I'll still take the side of the birds. <laughs> There's also a really interesting, again, with like the hinterlands, like Mexico City is a geographically really interesting place. And it's on this like neo-volcanic axis, this like volcanic mountain range that cuts across Mexico east to west. And it kind of separates like more the more like jungly wetter mexico in the south and like the little bit more arid and turning into deserts yeah, mexico of the north so it's in this really interesting location where you're kind of at a intersection between a bunch of different systems and we have these huge pine forests and these great oak forests like around us on the east west and south mostly and then these like more chaparral oak scrub kind of like desert or kind of landscapes towards the north and mexico city is in this kind of point where all of these things come together and yeah. so i feel like there's also this potential for just like a really interesting biodiverse almost like botanical garden approach yeah. to like and urban foresting that we that we we already kind of have here because there is yeah, a huge and, diversity. and we have a, a, an amazing weather. I mean, for most of the world, I mean, we we can grow food, we can grow it all no, year round. All year round. Mm-hmm. No, we don't. We don't have a season where you can. No, I really like envy some of my friends in the states that have like this six months of to planting and working in the garden, but then they have like this all these couple of months to plan what they're gonna do there in their garden. No, that season and they put their seeds in the cold frames and they start doing everything here we never have that time it's like never stopping it's like next crop and next crop which is amazing who's resisting you who's resisting yeah Mm. the water authority (laughs) (laughs) the water authority (laughs) no not really no I, i would say like urban gardens they are always very welcome because it's like very hard to find something bad about them. It's like what's water is an issue. Sometimes it's like if there's no access to water, well, that's a thing we have to really think around and solve. But usually, urban gardens are like one of the first steps that certain companies or institutions have worked with take because it's very tangible that they're doing something for the environment the norms that they have to do for no certifications and no like uh, all these green issues that they have to 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 do as a company to be certified and and to be considered a responsible social environmental responsible company and gardens are something that it's very tangible so it's one of the first projects that usually gets accepted but there's also a challenge because gardens, as different with the water system catchment, the water catchment system, is that gardens are alive. They need attention every day. As a system, you can just make it work and do the maintenance that you have to give it every once in a while, and it will be running without any more attention. Gardens do need an everyday attention and they need resources like people and also like keeping the fertility in the soil and the seeds and oh, everything that you need to keep that garden alive. And that's the challenge because sometimes projects start 
and are very blooming at the beginning and everyone's so happy and involved. But when the work really starts, you can see what happens. No, that's. <laughs> hey, don't look it, at that little flower it, it pot. Just, <laughs> that little flower pot's waiting just to be planted. <laughs> <laughs> it just becomes like something wild and some things that seeded will start growing, outgrowing, and it'll be a, like a fennel garden. <laughs> grows and grows. In my case, also, I've I've been surprised at how, in, in to a certain degree, little resistance we've encountered in terms of people being like, "No, that's a bad thing to do," or something like very little. No, no, I don't. We've had more. We've had more problems with co-option, actually, with like doing projects, and once the projects start really picking up speed and they're working really well and they're getting bigger, and we're working with governments and we're installing like hundreds or thousands of rainwater harvesting systems, and then it starts to be a little bit more. There starts to be more budget allocated to it and stuff like that, and then suddenly it turns out that you know, like the the municipal president's brother-in-law also has a rainwater harvesting company all of a sudden <laughs> and like gets all the contracts now. So we've had more problems with once things start really picking up and working really well, having kind of some weird yeah. corruption -y kind of stuff happen where they like kind of co-opted out and try to like re redirect the money towards people within their groups or things like that. I've had more problems with that than with actual direct uh, resistance. I think the rainwater that's falling on us in Mexico city Mostly just running off the streets into the sewage system. Nobody's really using it. We're not really taking anything away from someone. Yeah. There's like the water trucks, which is like a huge, you know, uh, so billion yeah, peso pizza. industry. Yeah. And they potentially one day might be after us or something. But really, the water crisis is so big that the water trucks, they're, they're running 24 hours a day all the time. And they still can't even close to supply the demand. So we're at, at this point, we're not really taking anything away from anyone. The water's just falling from the sky. No one was using it. We're not, nobody's losing work because of what we're doing. And so resistance has actually been, has been minimal. As I said, yeah. there's more of like co-option and, and then, corruption. And once there same. starts to be budgets allocated to this stuff, that's been much more of a chronic kind of thing that we've had to deal with. When uh, I just remember, like the resistance that we've had, it's not about the gardens. It's more where the garden is going to be set up. If there is a come, we had a very big and like potentially good project with the company that makes the the syringes for the shots, and they would. Now the problem was that the garden would attract butterflies and bees and different kinds of bugs and they cannot have any of that close to their installations so not well, that was the thing it's like but we need a garden that doesn't bring bugs <laughs> sorry <laughs> <laughs> no can do i mean you can set them up with some nice plastic plan. flowers yeah exactly you can go to that for my green walls but yeah that's the resistance we've had as things become more urgent what's activism's role and how far should activism go i think activism is a way you can also inspire people and especially young people that are much more eager to take the role of an activist and i think it 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 should lead to actions to concrete actions And it should be something that everyone does. Like this. Yeah, they're backing me up. The bells are backing you up. <laughs> yeah. They're singing for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's a way to live your life with a purpose, I think. And for me there like there's no way. I, I, I couldn't imagine myself going to an office and just pouring data into a computer for someone else and going, not finishing, checking out, going home connecting to Netflix or whatever and some TV and not oh, just eating like Maruchan and no oh, that's and that's like a herd like living as part of a herd I think right now it's a moment where we're transitioning to another era where we have to go back to the sacred the unity and doing things for ourselves so have been becoming an activist in your own life I think for starters maybe you don't have to go out with your signs and stop the traffic and put bombs <laughs> somewhere to make your message make your message get through 
It's more like being active in your own life. What can you do from where you are to make this a better world? And that's why I think everyone should be an activist. I agree a lot. I think a lot of the problems that we have in Mexico around like poor governance, for example, and stuff that we have a chronic governance <laughs> crisis since forever in Mexico. <laughs> I mean, there's there's a lot of reasons why that is, I think. But one of them, I think, is that Mexico tends to have a chronically, in a way, like under empowered population in terms of like political participation and governance. I think we come from a history where, you know, there was like a colonial structure where there was like a really strict hierarchy where it was very clear who was making decisions and who was just following whatever was said. And that's like fairly entrenched and I think internalized in a lot of people's heads. I think, you know, we went through 60 years of rule by the PRI, by the Institutional Revolutionary Party. We're also 70. like 70 years <laughs> now where we were like a fake democracy where, you know, people like where there were elections, but like the same party won every time and stuff. And I think that, you know, this history has has caused a certain kind of fatalistic disempowerment on people's parts. Not not applying to everything like as i said there's also this part where people are like taking things into their own yeah. hands building their houses building their communities saying like in the absence of a functional government well we're going to self-organize and do our thing and there's a lot of that which is freaking awesome and really interesting but i do think that there's this tendency to say like well you know how they are they're screwing it up they're just they're there's a lot of kind of acceptance of bad governance because of a sense that like I somehow like am, you know, irrelevant or impotent or just too, too small a, a piece or too low on the hierarchy of power kind of structure to do anything about that. And activism is kind of the opposite of that. So I'd love to see a population that reclaims a better sense of their own possibility to participate and to influence and to, you know, push for better governance and change. So in that sense, I really hope that activism in Mexico grows. Mexico is also a country where being an activist is literally dangerous. Yeah. No, like it's a country yeah. that kills activists mm -hmm. at one of the highest rates in the world. And it's full of activists anyway. It's full of, you know, incredibly brave people being activists, but they're also very often exposing themselves to being murdered or disappeared or things like that. And if there were a lot more of us, occupying those spaces maybe it wouldn't be that easy to maybe it wouldn't be that easy to just disappear the, yeah. i think that this is a country that really could use a lot more activism i tend to be and i think that we agree with this gabriel and i like an activism that's more focused on trying to build and create and propose mm -hmm. than it is to just kind of you know throwing tomatoes yeah. at or, or criticizing or tearing down things although i think we need a little bit of both but i tend to be more on the side of let's you know, promote an activism Maybe that's proposing and, and actively trying to build stuff. It could be like a proactivism. Like, I love it. Proactivism. Uh -huh. Yeah. Like being proactive. Oh, well, you have mm. to do the things just not, <laughs> no? Yeah. Proposing something. Mm -hmm. Proactive. Proactivist. I'm a proactivist. Pro exactly. I love I'm it. Gonna, yeah. I've never heard that no, and I'm going to use yeah, it. Yeah. <laughs> like pro I'll quote you. Proactivist. <laughs> <laughs> what brings you to hope? Ducks in a wetland that's treating raw sewage. <laughs> it's them. Yeah, that, that, well, that that's good. brings hope. <laughs> Rebar sticking out of the top yeah. of a roof. Be, bees in the middle of Reforma. <laughs> Harvesting honey or something. No, right on a rooftop in Sullivan. No, I have a friend that produces honeybee in, in Sullivan. I mean, right near Reforma. And it's amazing. I think it's the life... I think it's seeing that dandelion growing in the middle of the sidewalk. And seeing. I draw a lot of hope also from seeing how much people are actually kind of interested in and willing to help each other in moments. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Mexico is this place where one of the things that we have within our kind of psyche and, and kind of almost self-mythology has to do with like our response to natural disasters, for example. No, so for example, 1985, there was this massive earthquake, massive earthquake, huge catastrophic amount of buildings collapsed, lots of people killed, and the government failed pretty comprehensively in its kind of response to it. And there was this, you know, spontaneous mobilization of the population to, you know, do rescue work yeah, and to do amazing. all this stuff. Yeah. And I grew up 
hearing stories. I was two years old when that happened. I grew up hearing stories about the response to the earthquake and how like when the earthquake happens, everyone goes out and, and does this and everybody had their story. No, like, well, we had like a sandwich factory in the living room and then taxis would come and you just give them the bags and then they take them where they needed yeah. to go. My kitchen and was then, uh, the, from the, like, became a Red Cross exactly. kitchen. My mom would go and we would get like 80, 100 eggs and make scrambled eggs and take and them to the... And then send them out, no? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then in, <laughs> in, in 2017, there was a yes. massive earthquake and it was really amazing because there was this earthquake and it was like the whole population who had been raised on these ideas of this is what happened in 1985 and we just all went out and knew what to do. It was amazing. Like here in Coyoacan, like the lights went out, no, when in the earthquake and they were out yeah. for 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 days. All, no, yeah, for a couple Roma, days in many days. areas. Yeah. And you'd go out like the day of the earthquake, the night of the earthquake, and in every red light there was a group of teenagers directing traffic. And nobody organized them, nobody told them what to do. Just like high school kids were like, We will go like be the like red and green lights. And you'd have like these groups of like like fifteen to eighteen year old kids at every street corner, like stopping the cars in one direction, signaling the cars to pass in the other direction, like counting two minutes and like switching. And the whole city and was like awake and alive, sick. making sandwiches, giving them to people, like making mm. like nurse stations, coordinating where buildings had collapsed. You could be like, you know, hey, I have a where there's like 20 of us. We have shovels, we have picks. We're ready to go do like, you know, See, where rest, do we try go? to find people in the, ru- in the rubble. And people would be like, there's enough volunteers at like these two collapses. Like we need more volunteers in these other collapses and through like Twitter and everything. And like... No government, just spontaneous civil society, but disorganized, organized civil society. And that kind of thing gives me hope because we've seen it and it's it's there. Like the population responds to crises in these beautifully selfless and surprisingly well-organized and orchestrated ways. And that gives me hope because once you've seen that, you know that that's in us, no? Mm-hmm. Mm. Very inspired. There that was, was very the, the inspiring. earthquake is full of stories. See, si. see, si, see. Si. Is there anything we're missing in general? Yeah, a beer, mm. a beer <laughs> from the topic. <laughs> I don't know. Mm. I mean, I think we could talk about, but it's like a whole can of worms. No, but you know, Mexico City and and this, you know, relating to water, which is my main area of focus. Although I think, as we've been talking about, it's all connected. But Mexico City is a city that is going through a water crisis whose, I think, severity shouldn't be under-mentioned or something. No, we're, we're listed as one of the cities most likely to run out of water in the world. And just the kind of insanity of a 22 million person city that is literally running, <laughs> running out of water and what that yeah. actually... I mean, it's hard to even wrap our brains yeah. around what Same that thing. actually means because... I don't think there's, I mean, I know for a fact there's never been an instance in human history where 22 million people run out of water all at once in one place. I mean, there were never cities this big, you know, cities have run out of water, but not like this. And so just the the kind of crazy, the crazy situation that we're in and the stakes of, of this crisis. No, it's something we haven't talked about. I don't know what to say about it, except that this is part of our context. No, we're in this amazing city, this beautiful, resilient city. It's also a city that is facing a potentially existential crisis because of bad stewardship of natural resources, basically. And and that is the reality that we're in right now. No, we are still in a car that's very much headed for a precipice and trying to figure out where, where we go from here, no? So just a little bit more context of what the situation is. I, I usually never read news. I, I, I don't... I, I save my time to read whatever I need to read and get more inspired and being aware of all the bad things that are happening. But this is something very important that's not being said with the importance that it has. And, and yeah, it... It's something that we, hopefully, we we have to start being proactive much more sooner, not depending on what the government or the authorities decide how we're going to solve it and maybe just be more proactive and have our homes set up with 
water catchment systems, water recycling, water recycling, the, the, the right way to use water. In our urban gardens, we promote technologies like these clay pots that are you know, buried in the container and they're like leaking water little by little. There's this uh, thing called solid rain, Lluvia Solida, it's a polymer. Polymer. Polymer that absorbs water and it's no, it, it it's helps to save a lot of water not for no plants for producing food. So I think it's being creative, proactive and much more conscious on what the reality is. And that's not being said as clear as you just said it. That's not something we, we are very clear on. No. Who kissed who? Who divorced who? Who is <laughs> like all this news that's just making people get distracted and think those are the important things. And so I think it's going back to basics and being aware of where you are, what surrounds you, and what you need to to live. Proactivists. Proactivists. Yeah. This is the Hatch Podcast series. Mm -hmm. Gabriela. Enrique, thank you so much for being here and your time. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's really, a pleasure. It was a pleasure and I enjoyed this conversation. In Plato's Republic, he famously wrote, Our need will be the real creator. Need as the mother of invention is no new concept. And as the world careens ever onward towards precipices both known and unknown, demand for novel, innovative solutions in turn, grows ever more urgent, and perhaps commonplace. We often find ourselves looking to leaders and governments to direct solutions for our increasingly complex problems. But what better place to look than at the problem's source? As Mexico City struggles under the yoke of a burgeoning population and ever-dwindling resources, particularly water, it may find itself at the forefront of innovation, of those sorts of grassroots innovative efforts that eventually dictate structural change. In this case, residents of the city have long utilized creative strategies for water harvest, capture, and reuse, thereby reducing their resilience on government and supply chains. These everyday people simply looked at a problem and solved it to the best of their ability with what they had. They made resources last, and in so doing, they fed into their own autonomy they became pro-activists in their lives, livelihoods, and the future of their beloved city. There's much in this to aspire towards. As we look ever forward, it is perhaps our most humbling realization that those best prepared to pave the path into the future are those that laid the foundation for all the roads that came before it. It seems now more than ever that we have found ourselves on the cusp of monumental worldwide change. Whether we consider the environment, politics, infrastructure, health, economics, or inequities across a broad swath of social constructs, the consensus is clear and urgent. All is not as it should be. The United Nations, a consortium of 193 member states from around the globe, agrees. In 2015, the UN unanimously adopted the 17 Sustainable Development Goals the SDGs. These goals call for urgent action and global partnership to secure peace and prosperity for people and the planet, now and into the future. In alignment with the SDGs, Hatch, a curated network of artists, activists, and entrepreneurs working together to accelerate positive global change, has partnered with IM Interchange to fuse adventure journalism with experiential design labs to develop innovative solutions to complex global challenges. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening to the podcast. If you enjoy it, please subscribe or leave us a rating. This episode was produced by Yara Craner, Susan Carstensen, and me, Tate Chamberlain. A shout out to our media and production team, Jessica Byerly, Darko Sevilla, Raymond Ansodegi, Kevin Hilton, and Mark Groner. A special thanks to Yara Craner, Anya Bulis, Jared Silverman, Pete Strom, Aton Shapira, and Rachel Hicks. With so much gratitude to the Hatch supporters, Steelcase, the Kaufman Foundation, the Gwydion Fund, Envision Equality, 
the Hatch volunteers, board of directors, Hatch guardians, and the community who help make this work and mission possible. To learn more about Hatch, visit hatchexperience.org. Building community could not happen without food. And with that, I'd like to thank Whistle Pig Korean, Red Tractor Pizza, and Zocalo Coffee House. Do you have an issue that's riddled by gridlock in your community? Shoot me an email at tate at iaminterchange.org. That's tate at iaminterchange.org. Remember, share airtime and don't ruin dinner.